Welcome to the 337th episode of Chess TV. Today we'll tell you more about the candidate matches, the European Women Championship, and that the world elite will play in Basna Cakes. In today's opening fold, the analysis of the Scotch game continues. The chess puzzle is a checkmate in four moves, and in the chess story, Arne Johansson presents Salvio and Greco, two giants of the 17th century. Here we go. The Czech Republic Individual Chess Championship is being played in Hotel Lape in Pyrdovitz. Ten players with an average rating of 2,517 are participating in the Round Robin Tournament. The highest rated Czech player and title defender Grandmaster David Navarra could not defend the title due to playing in the Capablanca Memorial. This has of course made the tournament extremely interesting for the rest of the players like Grandmaster Stocek, Babula and Votava. The Women's Championship is being played in two groups of four players with a following playoff of the four best players. More information can be found on chesssvetla.cz. The fifth edition of the International Chess Tournament Basna Kings is going to take place on June the 11th to the 22nd with some of the best players in the world. With a starting field consisting of Magnus Carlsen, Vasily Ivanchuk, Sergei Karyakin, Hikaru Nakamura, Tamar Rajabov and Lidior Dittinisi Pinau, this tournament is sure to bring some interesting games. Last year, Magnus Carlsen won the event with a full two points advantage ahead of Rajabov and Gelfen, a magnificent achievement that all the other players will fight hard to prevent from repeating. The European Senior Team's Championship was played at the beautiful Dion Palace Resort in Greece. A quick peace treaty with Austria in the last round of the championship handed the gold medal to the team of Russia. Russia won with 6 matches, tied 3, and collected a total of 15 match points. International master Chenikov from the winning team shared that the team had experienced some difficulties with Grandmaster Tyshkovsky being unable to participate due to illness. But neither that nor the very strong competition could stop the Russian team. In the match between the two teams on this shared second place, Germany started off with two draws against Denmark 1 and then Grandmaster Ullmann scored to give his team a lead. Friedemaster Werner finished the job for the overall 3-1 victory and a silver medal for German team. Congratulations! The 4th Mumbai Mayor Cup International Open Chess Tournament is scheduled to take place from September the 15th to the 24th in Mumbai, India. A prize fund of 31,000 US dollars is promised to those who place best in the 11 rounds of play. We should also mention that all participants will be provided free accommodation at the Andheri Sports Complex on request. Chessfriends.com is the new professional online chess server on the internet. Quite young, it is already making rapid progress due to the fantastic interface and the multiple useful options that it offers. The basis of the online chess server is the real-time human or engine live games, tournaments and their attached powerful engine analysis. All games are also stored for later replay in an archive, while detailed statistics are always available to check out. Chess Friends features different language versions including English, German, Hungarian, Romanian, Czech, Slovak and Polish. New languages are coming soon. This site also has a nice news section with game analysis. Chess Friends can also be downloaded as an app for iPhone so that you can play chess whenever and wherever. The European Women's Chess Championships is being played in Tbilisi, Georgia between the May the 6th and 18th. After seven rounds, Grandmaster Victoria Smilde and International Master Bela Kopenashvili are in the lead with six points each. These two ladies are, are however, being chased by Katarina Lano, Lila Yakavashvili and Pia Kramnik who are all a half point behind. Follow the championship live at tbilisi2011.ge. The FIDE candidate matches are now in their second stage. The first leg of the event ended in two playoffs. Of the 16 regular full-time games, almost 90% were drawn, and the two wins, both scored with the black pieces, were enough to put Kamsky and Galfard in their next round, where they'll play each other. All these draws were not the result of lack of fighting spirit. Many of the draws were extremely hard fought, an attitude that continued on to the tiebreak games too. After extremely high drama where for example a clock suddenly stopped working in an extremely critical phase of a critical game, Grzyk and Kramnik moved on to the next round. The winners from these two matches will go on to play to win the right to challenge the world champion for his title. 
Last week in the chess historical episode, we visited Tabby Kyrka and saw a famous wall painting from the 15th century by Albertus Pictor in which death was portrayed playing chess against a man. This motif has inspired many artists around the world, like for example Ingmar Bergman who portrayed it in a scene in his movie The Seventh Seal. Last week we received a picture of a painting by John Walker, an English painter and art historian. John Walker actually saw Ingmar Bergman's film in the late 1950s as an art student and the imagery stayed with him. Now, at the age of 73, Walker wanted his work to portray the fact that the prospect of death has been on his mind. And so this beautiful painting came to life. The painting shows a younger version of the artist from the 1960s playing chess against death when Walker used to play with his friends. Last week we continued our analysis of the Scotch game, something we will do in this week's episode as well. We have previously seen what happens after in this position if black would play bishop to c5, but in this week's episode we will take a look at the slightly less popular move knight to f6. Alfred, how will this game continue? Well, as we now see black threatens to take the e4 pawn, something white really shouldn't allow. In order to hinder black from taking the white pawn, White has two, option, two options to choose between, knight takes on c6 and knight to c3. Knight takes on c6 is the little more popular variation and is followed by black recapturing with the b-pawn. To take with the d-pawn is sometimes a good idea, but in this position it gives black no compensation at all, because after an exchange on d8, white plays bishop to g5 followed by bishop to e7 and knight to c3. White has a spacious and well-coordinated position, while black, on the other hand, really has no initiative whatsoever. So instead of recapturing with the d-pawn, it lays in black's interest to take the, with the b-pawn. Another reason to take with this pawn besides that a capture with the d-pawn is bad, is that one should try to capture with pawns, so they move towards the center. The e4 pawn is still threatened and white has to choose between protecting it and by playing bishop to d3, or by taking it out of harm's way by playing e5. Knight to c3, the probably most common and natural way of protecting the e4 pawn, is not recommended in this position since black then can play bishop to b4, developing and threatening the, at the same time. So instead of knight to c3, let's see what happens after e5. The most popular continuation. The natural response would be to move the knight, but that leaves the knight vulnerable for attack and instead queen to e7 pinning the pawn is recommended, even though it blocks the black bishop on f8. Now follows queen to e2. The situation has changed. Suddenly black should move the knight to d5 and the difference lays within the fact that white's queen to e2 has made it so that now after white c4 Black doesn't have to move the knight from d5, since black instead can play bishop to a6, pinning the c4 pawn. White cannot allow the queen to protect a pawn which is threatened by a bishop, so white plays b3, which allows the bishop on c1 to develop to b2 in the future with a plan to protect the e5 pawn. The black bishop on f8 is in a horrible state, locked up on f8 square, so black plays g6 in order to release the bishop and also create a counterpoint against the white c1 bishop which soon will be positioned on b2. White who also has a weak king's bishop plays g3 with the same plan and now follows bishop to g7, bishop to b2 and castle kingside. Well, the position is equal but that doesn't mean that a draw will be the most likely outcome. Instead, one should consider the equality so that both players has equal chances to win. This because the position vary a lot. Black has very compact position with very active piece play, while white on the other hand has a very lofty position but with pieces which are not especially active. These differences in the position create a very dynamic game where anything may happen. We do now end this week's episode of The Opening School. We will be back again next week, so see you then.
In today's chess puzzle, we are to find a checkmate in four moves, and it is white that checkmates black. The position is taken from woman grandmaster Natalia Pogonina's game against Nana Daninze, which was played in St. Petersburg in 2009. Natalia Pogonina is a three-time European champion. She won gold in the first edition of the International Mind Sports game. She was one of the winners in the 2008 Student World Championship, and she won the Russian Super Finals in 2010. Besides her amazing chess achievements, Pogonina also has an MA in law from the Saratov State Academy of Law, so it's no wonder that she found this checkmate in four moves. The only question is whether you can measure up with her or not. You have one minute, good luck. to be aware of Black's attack on the C file. If Black only gets the chance, she will checkmate us in two moves by moving down the rook to C1. So that means that we have to check in every single move to avoid being checkmated. So what we'll play here is rook takes an h5 check. And we play this move because our queen has a strong diagonal to h8 here. And if the king would go down to g8, we would checkmate him in with the queen to h8 or the rook to h8. Black's best option is to capture the rook, the other rook takes back, and now if the black king goes down to g8, we checkmate him again. So black will instead go to g6. Now our rook on h5 is unguarded, and if we try to protect it in any other way, we get checkmated on c1. So what we'll do is to play it to h6 with a check. The king now captures the unguarded pawn, but that doesn't help her in any way, because now we play the deadly move queen to f4 checkmate thanks to our knight on d5. So there you go, this puzzle was quite difficult especially with the black threat to checkmate on c1 all the time, but it was certainly a nice checkmate. Great job everyone! During late winter and spring, we have devoted our chess history section to the period from the 13th to the 16th century. The Swedish chess history has been at the center, but we've also looked outwards towards the European horizon. Chess was reformed in the late 1400s and early 1500s, and uh, Spain with Ruy Lopez and others dominated the international chess scene. When we move into the 1600s, Italy, or the area that we now call Italy, becomes increasingly dominant. Well, one could actually say that the Italian school was taking over towards the end of the 16th century. And uh, the struggle of play became more aggressive and one started to study a number of new openings. Three years before the start of the 17th century, Horatio Dionuzio wrote a treatise with some new openings and problems. But uh, two other great Italian profiles stand out, namely Alessandro Salvio and Giacino Greco. Salvio was born around 1570, probably in Calabria, and was probably the world's strongest chess player around the year 1600. He started a chess academy or chess school in Naples, and published his book Trattato dell'Invenzione e Arte Liberale del Giocco degli Scacchi in 1604, the treatise on chess that is. 
Thirty years later, he also wrote a book with a long title starting with Il Putino. And Il Putino means something like the little one and refers to Leonardo da Cutri, who I mentioned a couple of programs ago because he played against Rui Lopez. Da Cutri got his nickname Il Putino since he was something of a prodigy in chess. After Salvio died around 1640, it took until 1723 before his book came out in a new edition. And it looks like this. The Italian school really dominated during the 17th century, and there were several other chess authors active during the first half of the 17th century. Carrera was one of them and published his book in 1617, but soon it was time for the next giant on the chess scene. Giacino Greco, who also came from Calabria and was often simply called Il Calabrese. He was born approximately 1600 uh, of poor parents in the village of Celico, and his original surname was Cusentino. He learned chess and made his way to Rome, where he got access to the books of Rui Lopez and Salvio. Greco gathered his notes with games and end games to form his first book on chess, Trattato del Gioco di Scacchi di Giacino Greco Cusentino. Well, that approximately means his own chess treatise. It came out in 1620 and is today a really major book rarity. His love of adventure and wish to test his chess capacity against the other chess players soon meant that he left Rome and traveled to France. In 1621, he visited the Count of Lorraine's court in Nancy, and then on to Paris, where he met the best French players. He was very successful and acquired a small fortune as a result of his victories on the chessboard. Pleased with his luck, he went on to England the following year, but had the misfortune to be attacked and robbed on the way to London. This forced him to restart with two empty pockets again in the English capital. His reputation had spread to London, and also here he got the opportunity to play against the leading chess players. After a successful period in London, he returned to Paris in 1624, where he rebuilt at least some of the lost wealth and worked further on his chess manuscript. He soon continued his travels and this time went to Madrid, where he played at the court of Philip IV, and also there defeated all his opponents. His love of adventure and travel prevailed over his interest for chess, and while he was in Madrid, he got to know a person from the Spanish nobility who persuaded Greco to become a travel companion and uh, on an extended cruise. In Murray's chess history book, it is stated that the trip went to the Caribbean and that Greco died there at least before 1634. He's supposed to have donated his fortune also to the Jesuits. His influence on chess development was mainly found in France, although he was Italian, and to some extent in England. His chess book appeared in many editions after his death, and the first English came out in 1656. It was translated to French in 1669, and the edition from 1689 looks like this. Note the old French spelling of chess, which in the early 1700s was changed to échec, E-C-H-E-C-S. The little book from 1689 looks like this. Greco's strength was not in the opening theory and position play, but he excelled in combinations and sacrifices. The sacrifices were perhaps not always objectively correct, but apparently sufficient to defeat his contemporary opponents. Well, we end here today and we'll return next week with a new theme, so see you then. Thank you for watching this week's episode of Chess TV. We are back with a new episode next week in which we will tell you, for instance, about the new European women champion. Be sure to watch it then. Bye.